Well, so if you could just share your name, uh, what degree um, you either received at USC or elsewhere, and what you're currently doing. So then we can start down the front. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Keith Walzinger. I'm the, uh, the old guy in the room. Uh, I got a master's in uh, aviation safety from USC back in 1982, and I'm a pilot for American Airlines uh, since 1985. So you can get a job after you graduate. I want to let you know that. It doesn't take too long sometimes. Uh, show of hands, who has ridden on an airplane? <laughs> Everybody. Who's interested in building airplanes? And who's interested in flying airplanes? All right, more than zero, that's very good. Um, I represent kind of the non-traditional engineering people, and uh, so we'll be talking about uh, flying airplanes uh, as we go along. Okay. All right. My name is Angela Bullen. I'm currently a senior supplier quality engineer for AeroVironment. I just started last week, so I don't have a lot of specifics on the company, but prior to that, I was basically a product quality engineer for both Make It, um, kind of building us assemblies for commercial aircraft, and then I also worked at Brexnord um, Aerospace, where they made uh, bearings also for um, the aerospace industry, so I have a lot of experience in product quality, um, kind of understanding customer requirements and how that gets flown down um, to all our levels of the organization and also our suppliers. Um, Kind of, I was looking for a change. I wanted people to be a lot nicer to me, so that's why I switched over to supplier quality. Because when you're the customer, people are a lot easier to work with. So um, let me know if you guys have any questions. Your degree. Oh, sorry. In my degree, I have an aerospace engineering degree. Um, I graduated in 2015. My name is David Reese. Uh, I was in the first graduating class from ASTE in 2009. Uh, and then I got a master's and PhD at Purdue in 2011-2014. Um, born and raised in Southern California, so Indiana was a bit of a culture shock. Um, came back, I work at the Aerospace Corporation, uh, which is a federally funded research development center. Uh, we're a nonprofit that serves mostly the United States Air Force and the National Reconnaissance Office uh, doing national security space. So we do everything from the launch vehicles to the spacecraft to technology design to technology maturation. Um, I manage a team of eight engineers, and uh, we have a blast working on all kinds of new rocket stuff. So that's it for me. My name is Adam Jones. Uh, both of my degrees are in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M. Uh, I'm here currently actually pursuing a PhD in neuroscience, in a totally different field, but I did work in engineering for a while in oil and gas uh, at ExxonMobil. Uh, also, sorry, I forgot to mention, an internship at Fred & Whitney, uh, Solzer Pumps and Bechtel Oil and Gas, with everything from field experience to a lot of um, large project experience at Bechtel, uh, producing or building large LNG plants. So pretty much the whole gamut for oil and gas for anyone who's interested in that side of mechanical engineering. Hey, my name is Matt McCormick. I graduated with an ME degree in 2012 and did the PDP program for my master's in 2013. I started my career in aerospace, uh, commercial aircraft interior space at Zodiac Aerospace for the last seven years. And then in December of this past year, I moved uh, to a, a EV and battery technology startup uh, based over in Vernon, California. Um, so I've kind of done a 180 in the industry that I'm in. Um, Right now I'm managing, uh, I'm a program manager, I manage uh, the operational execution and end-to-end -end development of uh, battery modules for light electric vehicles. Hey guys, I'm Daniel Moline. Uh, I graduated in 2013 with a degree in civil engineering. Didn't want to do that, so I stumbled into aerospace. Uh, I work at a company called QTech, where I'm the director of QA. I've been there for six years now. And uh, I manage a team of five quality engineers and 19 inspectors. So our product is basically the foundations uh, the, of frequency control for circuits. So basically clocks for satellites, airplanes, and oil drilling equipment. As you can see, we have a very diverse panel in terms of their experiences and industries that they represent. Um, our last panelist, Vanessa Wright, who works at uh, uh, Virgin Oprah, she's not here yet. I'm hoping she'll be on her way, but she may not be here, depending on if she got caught in traffic. I'm not sure. Um, but
but but other but um in the meantime we will yeah um just yeah continue with um our yeah our panel and this is really a time like i said for you to ask your questions so um to get uh, started though i think it'd be great to kind of hear more about their career journeys and where they how they ended up to what they're currently doing so um, if, you could, if you could just share just briefly like one to two minutes, I know it's hard to like <laughs> consolidate, you know, your whole career journey in, in that amount of time, but I think um, just to get, I think it'll help us get a sense of kind of what, you know, where, how you, um, you know, were able to um, be in your current position, um, if you can provide, yeah, some background to that. Okay. Uh, really quick. Uh, so get to be an airline pilot, uh, it's not a really easy process, but there's basically two ways of doing it. One is by joining the military and flying for them for a few years, and then you earn enough qualifications to work for the airlines. The other way is uh, to go on your own, pay for your own training, uh, get a few jobs that prepare you for the airlines. Uh, my first job was actually as an instructor. So uh, I was teaching other people how to fly once I went through the training myself. Uh, I flew some cargo runs between uh, Los Angeles and Las Vegas for a little while. I flew Grand Canyon Air Tours, which was kind of a fun thing. I don't know, has anybody been to Grand Canyon? Seen it? Flown, flown over it? Um, so that was, uh, I spent one summer doing that. Uh, I went from there to a small regional airline based in Santa Barbara, California. And that eventually qualified me to work for the major airline. So I've been there uh, 34 years now. I just turned 34 years. And uh, starting from flying engineer, which is not even somebody that flies the plane. You're sitting there running the systems on the plane, on the old ones before they had automation. Uh, and co-pilot on uh, several different airplanes. And then I've been uh, captain since 1992 on several different airplanes. Right now I'm on the 777 based in Los Angeles and I fly uh, all around the world. So it's a lot of fun. Right. Uh, oh, I also go on TV occasionally and uh, they, they asked me to talk about plane crashes. So I was just on TV this afternoon talking about plane crashes. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> my USC aviation safety experience came in handy. Um, all right, so um, I, while well, I was Still going to USC, I started, I interned at UTC Aerospace Systems in Chula Vista. Um, I interned there as a continuous improvement engineer and that's kind of when I got my first world experience of what it was like to work for a big corporation. I kind of fell in love with just the idea of continuous improvement and it's kind of a big kind of idea within the manufacturing world of aerospace, constantly trying to improve your processes and all that stuff. Like the, the main thing that I took away from school is that you really learn how to problem solve. So for me, that was the, the thing I enjoyed the most. So I really liked the fact that you were able to do that. So when I, um, after graduating, I heard about a job in quality, but I had no quality experience. So they accepted me as a quality administrator role where basically my main fun job function was to get all the parts that were returned by the customer, do kind of an initial evaluation to figure out whether we had accidentally shipped non-conforming to the customer. Unfortunately, you don't want to be in that situation, but it does happen. So that's kind of how I kind of started understanding what the quality management system processes were. Um, and from that, I kind of moved up to quality engineer based on having an engineering degree. Um, from there, so that was when I was working at, with Bearings. Uh, I was looking for a little bit more of a challenge, so I moved to a company called Make It there. Um, they kind of build assemblies. I was in charge of the motors for the seven eight, uh, Boeing 787 that cooled the power electronics. So um, it was a completely different type of job environment. Rexnord was very much a manufacturing-like environment where uh, Make It was simply just assemblies. We didn't make anything. All we do is put things together. So I got a little bit different experience there. Um, and now, like I mentioned, I'm working with uh, supply and supplier quality at AeroVironment where we make drones. So I'm kind of, my job is basically, once again, we're doing assemblies only. So my job is to ensure all the components for the drones are compliant. So that way we can have no issues on the production floor. Um, quality has been great so far. So I think that's kind of where I see myself continuing. Um, let's see, so I, started making rocket propellant when I was in high school. I had a very understanding chemistry teacher. And then I came here and um, was one of the founders of Rocket Lab. 
anybody is familiar with that organization, it's really fun, and I wish Traveler 4 all the best in a few weeks. Um, kind of on a whim, I was in Dr. Goodfellow's Repulsion class, ASTE 470, and I was planning to do PDP here to get my master's and go work at SpaceX where I had interned. Um, but Dr. Goodfellow said that Purdue might be a good experience. Um, and since I didn't want to be one of those bubble kids who never left Southern California, I said, why not? Um, went to Purdue uh, for two years, uh, did doing research for my master's. Um, that turned into a project for my PhD as well. Uh, so I got really lucky there. Met a great group of folks um, who are all rocket geeks. And uh, one of the people on my committee worked at the Aerospace Corporation in his former life. And he's one of the smartest, coolest people that I know. So I said, I want to be him when I grow up. And uh, applied to work at Aerospace, got the job, came in as a member of the technical staff, which is pretty much what everybody comes in as um, if you're fresh out with a master's or PhD. Um, did work on kind of mission assurance and technology development for a few years. Uh, worked on pretty much every major solid rocket motor program that's flying right now for the Air Force. Um, Delta IV Gen 60 outside SRB. New Gen 63, which just had its second static test today, which is very exciting. It went well, looks like, based on the video that Northrop put on Facebook. Um, <coughs> haven't heard back from the folks on the ground yet. Um, uh, new stuff for SLS, um, the Omega rocket that's being built. Um, so I had a good time doing that, and then there was an opportunity in the program side, so I jumped over to the program office, which is kind of the internal customer for <laughs> the tech staff at Aerospace. Um, the tech staff in the engineering group provide assessments and do the number crunching and MATLAB and you know all the, the detail nitty gritty stuff to generate data that the program office then distills down and presents to the customer as here's your options, here's what the risks look like, here's you know some good courses of action that you can take um, and the customer makes decisions based on that. Um, and uh, that was really fun, a lot more pressure, a lot more visibility to the government, um, there's a big political aspect to it. Um, I was lucky and that I was in a high visibility program. I was working on Vulcan, which is a mini ULA launch vehicle. Uh, I was the point of contact for the BE-4 rocket engine. So I used my Purdue relationships to work with Blue Origin very closely um, and uh, learn about what was going on there. Um, and um, presented that work all the way up through the general and eventually to, um, to Mike Griffin, who's the director for uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering for the US government. He's where all the money for the FFRDCs come from, so that was terrifying, but also really exciting. Um, and then after that, I went back to the engineering side, and now I'm managing uh, the group that I started in, uh, which is really exciting, because I get to kind of take my program experience and my engineering experience, and then combine those two with my staff to really be a force multiplier, and uh, I don't know, try and change the future. So that's what we're doing, and it's really fun. So, um, actually, before we actually got started, some of us were talking behind the scenes about things that we had uh, wanted in our career and or things that we had seen in our career that kind of made us change paths. So, I'll mention that, um, so during my master's, I specialized in rotor dynamics, which is vibrations of rotating <coughs> machines, in particular jet engines. So, I did an internship at Pratt Whitney. Um, however, when I went to um, graduate, I decided that I didn't think I would be getting enough travel Actually, that was actually one one piece that I wanted out of my career was to be able to travel with my job. Uh, thinking I'd be stuck in, in East Hartford uh, working for them. So I took my first job with ExxonMobil, naively thinking that I'd get to travel to nice places. Uh, lots of travel, but not necessarily great places. Um, great place where I learned a lot about root cause <coughs> analysis because they really want to manage the, the failure of the equipment because if production is stopped, which is where I work, uh, if production stopped, then they're losing a lot of money, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars per day. Uh, so that was something where I, I became specialized in that and was able to use that in the rest of my career after that point. Um, and because my specialization was in vibrations of rotating machines, I worked with the large compressors, pumps, turbines, etc. Um, decided to move from that to a slightly more technical position after that to solar pumps, where I was doing analysis for them on uh, vertical turbine pumps and also doing failure analysis uh, when anything went wrong in the field. Uh, from that, I decided to get back into a more project management-based position at uh, Bechtel, 
and at the time they were in the process of ramping up three large uh, LNG plants on an island off of the coast of Australia. Uh, currently there are five total in Australia that they're finishing up. And um, I got to touch every one of them at some point in my career. Some of them are mere are copies of each other, but some of them have unique uh, aspects to them. So there I got a lot of experience working with very, very large projects, uh, requirements, especially QA requirements that uh, could fill this room with paper, uh, or actually probably this building with paper. Um, and uh, lots of uh, analysis to make sure that even what we're trying to do with the process will, will work. Um, and then managing that through the construction phase, uh, because there's always problems that show up as you're putting pieces together and, and either they don't fit or uh, some type of, uh, like, we, we create a critical and one piece of equipment and we now have to modify it. We now have to have the, the vendor modify it in some way for it to actually work. Uh, so there's always challenges with that. And that's uh, my career, engineering. Uh, so as I mentioned, I began my career in the aerospace sector, more on the commercial aviation interior side of things. Uh, I interned for two summers at Zodiac Aerospace as one of the first hires to their advanced concepts team as a product <coughs> development engineer. Uh, got mostly, most of my experience was kind of in CAD, modeling new products, doing uh, quick turn mock-ups out of foam core, rapid prototype, things like that. Uh, and then started full-time after I finished my PDP uh, here uh, in mechanical. Uh, learned very quickly though that I didn't want to be sitting behind a computer all day designing things. Uh, and so I transitioned after my first year or so uh, over to the sales marketing team as a technical sales engineer. I forgot to utilize my skills as an engineer and apply those to more of uh, a commercial setting. Uh, from there, uh, I was working on a new proposal for the A350 uh, app complex, and we happened to have uh, Ed Zodiac, the A350 mm -hmm. laboratories program at the time. Uh, we involved that team and they actually pushed me away to become a program manager. Uh, with, with that group, so I began on a, a big program team uh, managing new developments for the laboratories. Uh, from there, uh, because of my ties with the sales and marketing team, uh, they had just sold uh, the CRJ, which is a small regional jet aircraft, uh, was, was doing a refreshed interior. They were dubbing the next-gen two or atmosphere interior. Uh, and so the sales team called me up and said, hey, we have this new program, would you like to manage it? So I got to manage end-to-end -end development of a, of a brand new regional jet interior. Uh, from there, uh, one of my previous co-workers at Zodiac called me up and said, hey, I'm at this new startup. Uh, it's uh, electric vehicle battery technology. I think we're doing some pretty exciting things. And I told him no for months and months and months because I was trying to finish out uh, this program. Um, and then in October or so of this past year, we had our first flight with the CRJ uh, new interior. And I said, okay, I'm ready to wash my hands of this and move on to something else. Uh, and uh, mid-December moved over to Romeo. So right now I'm doing program management for uh, battery modules for light electric vehicles. It's a whole new learning experience. I knew absolutely nothing about battery technology, uh, but I really enjoy the startup environment because it allows motivated individuals to succeed and, and move up in the organization quickly. So I realized late in my career at SC that I did not want to do civil engineering and my advisor sat me down and said, well, I'm looking at your grades and your transcripts and you really have two options. Uh, you can go and you shouldn't do construction because you're going to be terrible at it. You should either pick another engineering discipline for a job and do something technical otherwise, or you need to go get a PhD because the only thing you're good at is structural engineering, which requires a PhD to practice. And I didn't have the stomach for more student loans and more schools, so practical engineering it was. And uh, I was applying for a bunch of jobs, interviewing everywhere, and it just so happened through a friend I wound up at QTEP. And I started as a quality engineer, um, working on everything from writing SCDs, a word if you, were, if you work in aerospace you will come to know nearly and dearly, uh, for components. and working on the beginnings of root cause analysis and all of that. I did that for a couple years as a quality engineer. Uh, I have a minor in business from SC, so I got poached to go become the business development manager and work on expanding our markets um, for QTech. When I started, QTech was doing 
uh, $26 million a year in sales. When I left that role two years later, we were doing 32. So I got some nice pats on the back for that. Um, and we had a need to renovate our QA department. Our longtime director of QA, who had been there for 30 years, left. And the replacement that was hired was not so great of a communicator. And if you wind up you know, working in QA, you'll find out that communication with the customer is the most important thing. So I got asked to jump back in and shore that up. It was gonna be a 90 days until they could hire someone else. And 90 days turned into 120, turned into 180, turned into 360. And now it's been three years, so I, I guess I'm here to stay as director of QA. Uh, my job revolves around managing my team of inspectors and quality engineers. But most of my job is managing what's called the quality management system which is this overall practice that governs how you document things, how you handle analysis and the expectations that are kind of agreed upon with the provider and the customer. We, our customers are all of these companies. Um, we make stuff for oil and gas, we make stuff for deep space applications. Um, we would be considered a component manufacturer by most customers, um, even though our components do actually have sub them. We're not a capacitor manufacturer or resistor manufacturer. Um, I think that's, that's the basics for you. Great. So now that we have a better sense of you know uh, the career journeys of our panelists, um, this is the time to, uh, that we're going to open up for, for questions. So feel free to ask questions to the entire panel or specific um, questions to individual panelists. So this is, a, this is an open time for, for questions now. Yeah, go ahead. This is kind of for all of you. Uh, how many of you have ended up uh, in the career that you imagined when you first started in college? Just a few of you. So, airplanes or rockets? I think, yeah. <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> Cut and dry. A few of you mentioned it. What were some of the big driving factors that uh, landed you where you are? Uh, happenstance, plans, through experience? I worked really hard at it. Since about age 11, I wanted to be an airline pilot, and I just asked every airline pilot I could find how you got your job and what training you had, what background you had. Uh, uh, all my professors, uh, I, I studied aviation at San Jose State for undergrad, uh, came here and then uh, kept getting one job after another job after another job. So uh, even though my parents were bugging me to just get a job for God's sakes, you know, start paying off your student loans, I said, no, I'm going to wait till I can do something with, with flying. So. Um, if you're focused, you have an idea what you want to do, it's fantastic. Go ahead and do it. If you're not sure what you want to do, try a few different things until you, until you settle on something. As you heard from everybody else, people don't necessarily end up in the field they studied in school. So don't feel, uh, if, if you're not satisfied with what you're studying, don't feel locked into that. Yeah. Um, I think I was very lucky. Um, I knew when I was a little kid that I really liked rockets um, in science camp and when I was like seven and it was the coolest thing ever. Um, and then I came to USC and found a group of rockiners to hang out with and that was gratifying. And then in grad school the same thing happened, um, guided there by Professor Goodfellow. Um, and then I just kind of sought that out for my job and I'm lucky that it ended up being in a place that I like being and um, being at a well-respected company, I think. He told me that he likes this at least. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, so yeah, it was it was a little bit of guidance, um, a lot of work and a lot of luck. I think for me, um, I was one of the kids in high school where you're good at math and science, you're going into engineering. So I did really had no idea what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I oscillated between architect, accountant, like pretty much everything that started with an A. Um, and, uh, you know, when I got here, I realized that my strengths necessarily didn't lie in, like, the research, super technical depth sort of areas, um, but, uh, you know, and, and that was only reinforced after I got into the working environment. Um, I didn't want to sit behind a computer designing things all day. I wanted to interact with people. I wanted to use my skills that I developed here uh, to, you know, in, in other areas. So, um, for me, it was more... Uh, asking for opportunities, um, jumping to the chance as they were presented to me or taking them for myself uh, and, mo and moving around. So I, I've had 
I, I worked at Zodiac for seven years and had four different jobs uh, in entirely different, you know, entirely different areas. So, um, and to be honest, I still don't know exactly what I want to do. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, as long as you keep yourself open to opportunities, you, you know, you're not limiting your possibilities at least. I thought I was going to go and get a degree in civil engineering and then go become an architect. Uh, then I realized and learned pretty fast I can't draw, so <laughs> architecture school is completely out. Um, I worked every summer, every winter break of my entire college career for a startup called Cirrus. It's now called Riverbed, um, that made industrial Wi-Fi devices. It was a product company that sold to every to convention centers, airports, hospitals, that kind of thing. And I really liked it. I thought afterwards I was going to go work at a startup. But working at a startup is, I found, would be really exciting. But you have to it, believe fundamentally in the product. Because a lot of it is, a lot of the early payment is hopes and dreams. And, and I got a lot of advice on that. And I, when I was looking to graduate, I couldn't find a company that I believed in. I didn't want to go work at Snapchat or Facebook or Twitter. I didn't understand why those products were as important to people as they are market valuations say otherwise, but it was not <laughs> something I understood. I understand like technology and other parts of it, not necessarily things involving the internet. So I needed to go work at a place and I couldn't find the right startup. So it was, the next closest thing was I couldn't do a big corporation, not at least early in my career. I could probably handle it now, but this company was probably the right size. It's 160 employees. Um, so I, st I just got started and since then you kind of carve out what you like and don't like. Um, I learned pretty fast I'm passionate about the business so while I don't like sitting behind my computer as much anymore hammering out things on AutoCAD, I'm really passionate about what we can do to grow our business and I did a couple years doing straight business development but I see the impact of my decisions and of how I can make my organization efficient and how I can you know, shave hours or days off a process or remove some step or add a step that's different or integrate some optical technology and, you know, see that eventually drop to the bottom line. And I'm really passionate about this company or any company I'd be at growing quarter over quarter, year over year to become bigger and better. I can go, I guess for me, when I interned at um, UTC, um, they had a, they had like a rotational program that you could do after school, and one of the things that I learned is that about 80% of the people that ended the rotational tour, or sorry, program, um, they ended up either as like load engineers or something, where all they're doing is CAD all day, and it basically just scared me because I thought like, I mean, you you have an aerospace engineering degree, like you just don't want to do structural like analysis all day, not maybe not structural analysis, but you know, you don't want to do CAD all day. So for me, what I really like about my job is that I get to touch the product every day. Mm -hmm. For me, that's really important to be able to go to the production floor, understand how we're building things, how I can establish things that um, eliminate human error and things like that. Um, so that's why kind of for me, I was very much attracted to the manufacturing environment. And um, that's why I like what I do. Yeah, one additional thing to that. So um, I think I mean, it's been mentioned or echoed kind of in what they were saying, but I think paying attention to what you gravitate towards while you're doing things right now. Uh, having good mentors is a big thing. I feel like I didn't necessarily have the best mentors in my undergrad, but I did have better mentors in my graduate school. Um, what you, yeah, what you gravitate towards and what you feel like are interests of yours. Now, the, the place where you may be able to apply that may not be super obvious. Um, for instance, CAD's been mentioned several times, and uh, I felt the same way. There were times that, that I didn't necessarily want to do analysis all the time, which is why I left my, my second job, even though I gravitated back towards analysis because I didn't feel like I was making use of my master's at all at Exxon. Um, however, I met people while I was there that for them, that was the best job, that was the most perfect fit for them possible. And you'll have different things that interest you, and um, kind of, keen in or paying attention internally to what those are. And ultimately that's actually what led me back to academia and to neuroscience because 
uh, in the middle of my career, I started doing research on the side, and I'm like, wait a second, this is becoming bigger and bigger part of my, like, outside of work hours. I'm, I'm researching more, I'm now seeking out collaborators, maybe I should go back into academia, and, uh, and research an interest of mine for the entire time. I mean, like Matt, I ha was good at math and science and said, okay, engineering. Uh, but I also didn't pay attention at the time that I'm also like really interested in psychology and, and this could have turned into something as well. Not that anyone else has those interests or uh, has interests outside of engineering, but there are lots of things within engineering that um, you'll, you'll have the opportunity in your courses or in seminars or uh, anything that comes to campus for uh, programs. I'm not sure what all ex exists through Viterbi. Uh, just pay attention to that and I think it helps guide, will help guide you. Um, startups have, in my at least my experience, startups have often a more fluid culture that adapts more readily to new people. So there's a lot of you know there's a lot of new people coming on board of the startup. I mean, when I was at the one I was at, I was employee number seventeen. It was tiny when I got there. By the time I left, the startup four years later was two hundred people. But to get to 200, they had been through 350 people. There's a lot of people, it's very welcoming in that. QTech was welcoming, but if you're at an established company, you'll often have employees with decades of tenure. So my department, I have five QEs that work for me. One is younger than me, the rest are older. Two of them are over the age of 70 with PhDs. They work for me. And that is a completely different set of challenges in an established place culturally. Because someone's been doing it away their way for 20 years, they're not necessarily as willing to adapt. And so I didn't encounter any of that in a startup. When I was there, it was always like, what can we change? How do we be fluid? Well, especially in aerospace, we don't change fast. I mean, unless there's a catastrophe going on, which everyone is forced to change and swallow that pill, Changes are slow. Specifications will sit in revision with the government for two <laughs> years, waiting for them to get signed off. We'll go to conference after conference, waiting, oh, what did the task group say this quarter? Uh, well, we're still working. Okay, that goes on for like nine months before someone submits a new draft. So it, it's it's very different. And that's I'm not trying to idealize the culture of startups. There's a lot of risks to them. Um, and there's a lot of advantages to some of these established companies, but it, it is very different, at least mindset-wise. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, the mm -hmm. the fluid culture, the fluid organization, uh, really allows for a lot of opportunities. As I mentioned, um, you can come in, and if you hit the ground running, willing to learn, willing to work, willing to put in the time, um, those opportunities will present themselves almost immediately. Um, since joining, I've only been there three months, I've already taken on an ad ad additional program. Um, my boss, who's only been there nine months, is being promoted to COO. Um, so it, it really allows for a lot of opportunities, whereas you know, in a large established aerospace company, you're dealing with uh, people who are really ingrained into the organization, who've been there a long time. It's occasionally more difficult to move uh, vertically. Um, let's see what else. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I think what I found myself at, at Zodiac, um, I loved working there, I loved the people there. I love the products I was working on, but uh, because of the pace, I felt that I wasn't being challenged on a daily basis, and uh, moving into a startup environment, that's now the case far and above. Um, so it's really depending, it, it depends on what you're looking for in your career, what you're looking for in your work life, uh, in, the, in the day to day. And I would also add one thing, like, just to give you guys like real life stuff, you know, Sitting in college, I often thought, oh, here's how life would go. Life throws you curveballs and wrenches, and different things become important to you in your mid-20s, and then in your late-20s, and then I'm sure in your 30s and 40s and otherwise. So, you know, startups are great. There's a lot of upside. There's a lot of great things culturally about them. Um, there is something to be said in certain cases for stability in a company that is rock-solid and been there, you know? 
Aerospace Corporation ain't going away. Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Mega, they're not going anywhere. So certain people, as you're going through, if you have the right opportunity and otherwise, like, I, I don't want to understate that, you know, part of having a job in one of these companies is like, it's easier to buy a house if you know the company is going to be profitable <laughs> forever and ever. You're not worried about what's going to happen the next year. And, and while that was less important to me when I was initially graduating, it is much more important to me now. Where I would only join a startup now if I, you know, if he doesn't like, believe in the product and people were like hammering on my door going, no, no, no you're something you're not, you're missing here. Like understand why this is revolutionary. Whereas like now I'm, I'm passionate about going to this company or anywhere else to doing that kind of in a more stable environment. And I've also found that you encounter a lot of the same problems in both sorts of environments. The pace at which you have to react to those problems is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in a startup as well, you have the added layer of the challenges of cash flow, right? You don't have money flowing into the organization. So you have to make, uh, I, I remember during my interview, um, they, Romeo had, had asked me, like, had I ever made a bet the business decision? And at the, at the time of my career, I, I said no. I mean, I've never made a decision that would financially potentially impact the outcome of the, the whole organization. And now even three months in, that's, it's almost like a weekly or, or even monthly occurrence um, for, for high level decisions like that. So. I don't have one I missed, but I have one I recommend, which is just sentimental and, the, and nostalgic. Um, no, I'm going to be completely serious. When you're seniors and graduating, last month, go take a tour. Go on an actual guided tour of the university. Highly, highly recommend it. So, bury that in the back of your mind for, you know, late April of the year you graduate. I think for me, I got involved in a lot of non-engineering things. Um, I did concert choir for two years. We sang at Disney Hall. It was awesome. I did uh, Trojan Vision for two years. I worked for Athletic Video for two years. I ran the video board in the Coliseum. It was like all this other stuff. I worked at Bovard. I ran sound for Tito Puente. Like <laughs> it was amazing. Um, and taking advantage of all those opportunities taught me a lot of other skills besides engineering that I now use in my everyday job. Like today, I spent my time writing code that would help us see our budgets better. And that was stuff I learned to do at Trojan Vision when we were working in the, the production group that you know build clients and stuff. So um, take advantage of something that is outside of your normal swim lane and it'll really kind of build you into a better person. Now you have an awesome stereo at home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will add one thing on what, what he just said, which is communication is far more important than you'd expect when you leave academia. Like Being able to see eye to eye, make a customer or a supplier understand what you mean and why you need something, and doing that with tact and urgency is very valuable. And that's what kind of lets people move up and... You know, there are some folks that really just want to do number crunching and engineering, and that's great, but the people that get, you know, promoted and move further up are people that can convince other people that they deserve that. So get involved in things that will make you communicate, whether that be those positions or anything else. Yeah, going off of what he was saying, I was going to recommend being on the executive boards for different organizations within Viterbi. I think that was really helpful for me um, because it helps you kind of learn what it's like to be in a team environment, which is something you're going to experience throughout the rest of your career. And then also just um, being a leader to those around you, mentoring them, things like that. Those, those are things that you're always going to, skills you're always going to use. Oh, where are some, I guess, important skills or uh, characteristics important to look for when hiring an engineering student? And uh, how important would you say is having a high GPA during school time? I 
ask a manager. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess GPA is important because it shows me that you took whatever you were doing seriously. Um, I don't sweat that. I would not be as nervous about that B you got in junior year one class at all. I mean, I don't, in my role, it depends on what I'm looking for, but in general, if, it, if the number starts with a three, I'm, I'm, I don't really have any questions. Engineering school's hard, people deal with different stuff. I take the interview much more seriously. Can this person, is this person trying to become an expert at what they do? You know, you can be someone who went through school and, you know, skip by and just copy homework from other people, do the bare minimum to get through a test, that's fine. And people will get through with better GPAs than you might expect doing that. I remember a lot of them. But there are people that like actually cared about, even if it was one subject, and can sit in an interview with me and just explain it. And that's what's kind of kind of crucial. Like when I'm hiring someone, I want them to be passionate about the company. I for sure look for the little things, like when did this person follow up with me? <coughs> Was it generic? Did they remember our conversation? Um, those are those are big. And then, you know, do they know the company? Do they know what they're getting in for? And do they show the, the propensity to grow? Um, doing research on the company is like, if someone goes to apply to a job at Northrop, Northrop is an enormous company. Like, you gotta really look at what the role you're gonna be doing. So you gotta give the same amount of interest to that as figuring out what QTech, which is a small company, does. Like, did you do the minimum, at least go on our website and try and understand what our technology is? Those are those are crucial. I, I'll piggyback on what uh, Daniel just said. Uh, you go into interview the American Airlines, one of the three big airlines in the United States, and you're interviewing along with 50 other equally qualified people who have the exact same qualifications, licenses, flight experience, college degree as you do. So what do you have that makes you stand out? And they're, you know, you're basically, and you're in a cockpit with one other person for six hours. The basic question is, do I want to be in a cockpit for six hours with this guy? If the answer is no, you don't get the job. Doesn't matter how many experiences of flying you've got or if you went to the moon. If, if you're not easy to get along with and people don't want to get along with you, you're not going to get that job. Uh, the, the second thing, knowing about the company. When I interviewed at American Airlines, I was the first, we had three rounds of interviews. They, it's a little bit different today. But the first round of interview was with a uh, HR personnel uh, guy that's been with the airline for many, many years. And the first question he asks me is, tell me something about American Airlines that I don't know. So, and that goes for any interview with any company, startup, large corporation. You're not gonna know so much about a startup maybe, but a large corporation, Northrop or Airlines, Boeing, you know, look it up, find out what's their stock price that day. There's a lot of things you need to know that you can impress an interviewer with and it's not really that hard to do a little bit of research. Um, so I hire people for my team, and GPA is a screen for me. Like, you know, if, you, if you've got something above a threshold level, like, great, done. You're smart, you're in, we'll talk. Um, we make all of our candidates do a briefing or a seminar. So how good you are at communicating is huge. Um, and then it's, it's the passion and curiosity and, and interest in the subject. Having the interest to do the research in the company, having opinions, and then having data to back those opinions up. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure I got the job at aerospace when I was walking back from lunch and there was a cabinet full of hardware from a famous rocket engine called the RL-10. It was designed by Pratt & Whitney back in the, in the 60s and we still fly it today. Um, and I said, oh, it's RL-10 parts, that's my favorite engine. And the manager who was hiring me said, why? And I went on this whole rant about why it's this amazing thing. It's a beautiful machine. Um, and I think that sealed the deal for me because if you're curious and passionate about something, you're gonna wanna stick with it and learn about it. And that's, that's really what we need you know, at any company. 
Wait, I have a question for Matthew. So like, I want to know like how difficult the transition was from uh, a mechanical engineering background to something like battery technology. Mm -hmm. Like, like what new skill sets do you really need from? Like so in, in my current role, I'm not required to be a technical expert you know, on, on, on batteries. We have PhDs who work in cell science and battery technology and, and systems and things like that. Um, I, I think what has benefited me most is just my willingness to learn. So, I mean, honestly, I knew absolutely nothing about batteries. I, I knew there was a positive and negative term, terminal electrolytic fluid that sep and, and then a separator between the positive and negative side, and that's literally it. And uh, thank God they didn't ask me to, you know, go into any technical depth during my interview. Um, but, but really, it's, it's all about, it, especially for moving out of a technical role, for me, it's all been all about um, you know, grasping at those opportunities, you know, taking initiative. Um, if, if you're not given something, take it. If you don't see something, look for it. Like, um, you really have to go, especially in a startup, you really have to go and get those opportunities. Um, but yeah, it, I, technically uh, the transition was tough just because I had to learn something new, but um, when you're in it, in the day to day, it, it's something that, that you can pick up pretty easily, I think. One of the things that's benefited me, at, you know, as an engineering student, is that even though I'm not using, you know, differential equations or other things that I've learned while I was here, it taught me how to problem solve. It taught me how to, you know, think critically and, and uh, you know, evaluate situations before I act and things like that. So those are the, the types of skills that that I still use on a day-to-day -day basis, even even though I'm not like in the technical depth of the product. How about one last question um, that can be applied for each of our panelists? So that will be a way to um, just end our, our time because we are um, close to um, the end of our the panel. So does anyone have a question that can be asked for everyone that you would think about? Or has an asked a question? Maybe? Okay, let me go ahead. It seems like, yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> well, I think I have to ask one more question. Nice, so. so what's the ratio of uh, what you're using now that you learned in school and what you've learned since being on the job? <laughs> Are we defining that in, as like <laughs> academic terms or things we learned in, at college? I, I mean, I mean, however you want to define it, because I know problem solving is something that uh, you don't exactly learn, but you apply when you're in the professional environment. I'll go with 50-50. Um, yeah, there's a ton of stuff you learn on the job. All the specifics, unless you get hired into an ultra niche thing that is exactly what you study, um, all of the day-to-day -day stuff is on the job. I mean, you're gonna walk into a company, you're not gonna know the first thing about how their computer system works. Yeah, you can navigate Windows and Open Office and, and Outlook, great. But like, you're gonna have to learn a whole ERP, a whole backend system. Like that is, and that takes a ton of time to master, to just become good at it. But yeah, you know how to use computers from school. I guess the biggest thing for me was just general engineering problem solving. You kind of get in Viterbi, no matter what the discipline is. Um, I've used a couple of structural things for some oddball stuff, which was just luck of the draw. And then I, I can speak for myself, I was not that sociable coming out of high school. I was like, math and science and coming to SC and getting involved <laughs> in all sorts of other stuff I was involved in, like brought me out of my shell. And that was, that was something I for sure learned here. Uh, for me, I think if we split like technical skills and more of the like EQ personal skills, um, technical probably like zero to 10% of what I learned here, <laughs> but every, every single day I use, you know, uh, interpersonal skills and things that I developed here in that sense. Um, the one thing that I definitely still use is for any ME students who take MECOP, the rigor of the reporting and how things are supposed to look and how the formatting is supposed to be. I use that every single day and when people submit paperwork or documents or presentations to me, I thoroughly judge them if it's not up <laughs> to the standards that MECOP set, definitely. Yeah, like you said, there's gonna be a lot of paperwork and your career and there's going to be a lot of uh, presentations. There's going to be a lot of communicating with people. All those are really hard, are really important skills. Um, I think even for myself, uh, it, even in one particular job, let's say one particular project I was working on, or one role, the periods of time where I would be using, let's say, 
the the more deep technical skills I learned during my degree and the times where I was spending more time, let's say during reporting or communicating a problem or working with a customer, et cetera, those would go in cycles. And so uh, unless you're doing, let's say analysis, even, well actually even, even my job that had analysis straight most of the time, I was still punctuated by times where I would have to be communicating those results, et cetera. Um, I don't think, even at its lowest, I don't think I ever got as low as maybe 10%, but somewhere between 30 and 20% was actually most, probably the average over my career, of technical. Um, shout out from Mecca. I spend <laughs> too much time formatting people's reports and I hate it. Um, <laughs> To answer your question, I use everything that I learned in school. Yeah, imagine this you in flying plane. Um, but it's like a divide by zero error because <laughs> it's 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 a fractal. You're always learning, sure. and you need everything that you know to learn what you're going to know next. Mm -hmm. um, and the world is always changing, and having the amazing engineering tools to understand that change and how to interpret that and how to interface with that has, has been the, the biggest thing. Um, uh, some of my mentors at aerospace have jumped back and forth from the rocket side, the spacecraft side, to the technology side, and back again. It's like, how, how do you do that? Is the question I always ask them. And you know, they say once you kind of develop that engineering tool set, you can apply it to anything, and you can learn what you need to. But get the fundamentals down and get them strong, um, and, and and yeah, you can you can learn the rest. So, um, for me, I would say it's been very low. Um, the main things that I learned, once again. Oh, Mechatronics was probably like the best class I've ever had. Professor Radovich was like the best professor here, at least in my experience. Um, ex you learn to be really good at Excel, first of all, which is like main thing you're gonna ever use, always spreadsheets will never leave your life. Um, but the other thing that's, that was kind of cool for me is that I didn't necessarily get to code MATLAB anymore or use LabVIEW. But what's nice is that when you go to the production floor and they're running an acceptance test for a, an assembly, and you can see that how they kind of built the test, like that's the kind of stuff that it's useful for if you ever need to troubleshoot and stuff like that. Um, I wasn't doing any of the troubleshooting, but it's nice to just have some fami familiarity with it, that way you're not intimidating by going in and problem solving. Um, I would say the one of the things that I didn't really learn in school that I wish I had learned a little bit more of was just kind of, you have to remember that when you're working, you're, you're going into a business, and I didn't really think about that when I was graduating. Like, I was like, oh, I'm an engineer, and I'm really cool, but you're working for a business, so you have to also kind of keep in mind that the things you do at the end of the day affect the business, so you kind of have to have that in the back of your mind, and I wish I would have had a little bit more of that in school. Uh, I'd say it's probably about 75% of what I learned in school I, I'm using. Uh, the school being the academic side, when you're going to be a pilot, there's flight school involved, which is completely outside of the college environment. So uh, in my case, I was kind of paralleling. I was in college and flight school at the same time, so it was kind of double school the whole time I was at, at, in college. And in the United States, we have five levels of licenses that are required till you get to the top license which is the minimum entry level to get to the airlines. So, uh, and each license requires to take a written exam and a practical exam with an examiner sitting in the other seat in the plane watching you fly. So it's like going for your driver's license five times and making it harder each time you go for the next one. Uh, but the two together, the college and the flight school uh, makes you ready to go for any kind of flying job you would get. So we're already at a little past 8 o'clock. Um, I just want to wrap up our time. Uh, hopefully this was um, helpful for you. Um, I know that I always learn a lot about um, at the various fields that our alumni industry professionals represent. And for me, it's a, it's a really great learning opportunity. Um, hopefully, yeah, you, you um, gain a lot from their insights. So uh, like I mentioned, uh, they are, some of them will be sticking around. It, you don't feel obligated to, because I know it's, it's already kind of late. But if you, if you do have the time, we have a room until uh, you know, 8.30. So feel free to stick around if you guys want to speak with our panelists one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So let's thank our panelists for being here tonight. And, uh,
Thank you for being here. I appreciate it.